Sports Show presents House of Rugby. Hello, my name is Maura Rasnigul and you're all very welcome to House of Rugby. The 2024 Guinness Six Nations has drawn to a close and Ireland have been crowned champions for the second year running. Joining me in studio to look back at the final round of games and look ahead to what's around the corner for Ireland are James Downey and Lindsay Peet. You're both very welcome. James, it was a tricky enough encounter at the weekend, a nervy performance in parts from Ireland, but they have claimed the championship for the fifth time in 11 years and that's a massive achievement. Look, it certainly is. I think coming into the game, we were all pretty disappointed about last week's game against England and, and how that turned out and obviously took away our Grand Slam and the first ever back-to-back Grand Slam for us. But it's it's a case of um, job done, really, you know. And I, I know I've said that a couple of times that I've been on here, but it is. It was They stumbled over the line, you could kind of say. But you got to give credit to the Scots, the defensive um Performance was superb. They made 233 tackles, I believe, um, double what um, mm-hmm. double what Ireland put in, and yeah, we we just about got there. I think things might have been a little bit different, perhaps, if we got um, a couple of if the tied furlong for me that was a try. Yes. Um, if that goes over, if you get these little things that go over, the game changes. But ultimately, they've got to be happy with where they got. They stumbled over. It was a nervy finish. It was a nervy end, but. We got there. Yeah, it wasn't a perfect performance, Lindsay. We were expecting a reaction from Ireland after being beaten by England last week. But the Scots were always going to come to Dublin fighting after Italy got the better of them. But why couldn't Ireland hit their straps in that first half? I don't know. I'd say it was a couple of things. Like, I mean, Scotland come in, albeit they're very, very inconsistent. Win, loss, win, loss, you know. Um, and, and that's probably the theme of them. They come in leading the stats on on a team who hit dominant tackles and that that James just said it there. They worked extremely hard. They probably took a leaf out of Wales's book where they kind of targeted the definitely the breakdown. They weren't illegal, but they certainly slowed at first. So I think look, being on the other side as a player, there's you want to bounce back, but you also then probably want to do everything very well and you just are overthinking it maybe like even that turnover and Dan Sheen being put into touch going down the blind side they're just things we don't actually we've never done so you're just out of kilter and sometimes it was a kick up the arse we needed against England albeit that we didn't want to lose and sometimes it takes a bit of it, it takes a little bit of time of putting games together to get back on the saddle get back on the horse put confidence together so I just think they were they were nervy there was so much on the line for the final game especially after that England results and sometimes it just doesn't take one match to fix it and look being on the other side and if you're in that playing group and you want to bounce back you kind of really you know, bring everyone in closer and you're kind of giving two fingers to everyone outside because it's very hard to just perform on the you know give up this performance just because everyone else on the outside of your circle is looking for it. You do intrinsically want it for yourself but sometimes between pressure and nerves it just doesn't always come out but I do agree uh, Ty Furlong's how that wasn't a try is beyond me. Yeah, They showed a lot more in the second half and played more direct rugby and to their credit they were determined and they showed grit to close it out at the end and that's probably one learning that they took from last week the way they closed out the game after Hugh Jones crossed the finish line. Yeah, look, I think so. I think everyone um, was kind of heart and mouth stuff when Hugh Jones got through so so easily. Um, that was pretty disappointing, you know. And I think yeah, they saw it the game rightly enough. But I think it's like the group as a whole is the expectation outside, you know, that we all have as as pundits, as people in the media, whoever it is. It's we expect Ireland to do so well and to kind of yeah. nearly walk this. Like you know, we get over France and we're like, okay, well, this Irish team we expect. Mm-hmm. A, a grand slam out of them, you know, and it's amazing how far we've come as a nation from y- your 90s or your, you know, early days of success. And um, I'm sure the players feel that expectation and that does filter down through into the squad and, and there's nerves there. But yeah, look, it is. They're able to see out games. I'd expect them to be able to see out the game. You know, Scotland, we're looking for a first triple crown as well for uh, since 1990. Um, and you've got to give, as I say, credit to them. But this Irish side, even when they're not playing well, to be able to get over the line is is a good sign of a of a of a very strong team, you know. And um, previously, if we don't if we play like that against Scotland, we'd be beaten. So I think credit to them for for getting the job done. Yeah, it's not an easy thing to do to win back to back championships. This is the first time or the third time ever that Ireland have managed to do that. And when you look at how teams for how the form of other teams were after the World Cup and the amount of changes that Ireland had in their team as well. Like it really is a huge achievement that should be celebrated. 
hugely. And like, there's a couple of things on this. Scotland came to town looking for a triple crown. Scotland came to town on the back of only beating Ireland once, which was back in what? In Croke Park in 2010, was it? Yeah, around then. Um, so to only win one out of 10 matches against that, you know, Irish opposition is, is not something they would have been proud of. They obviously lost in Rome last week against a very, very improved Italy team again. So they came here for pride. So there was a lot on. We, we were not giving them credit about what mo- motivation they had coming to, to Dublin last weekend. Um, and I think as well, there was the what the 36, we were 36 nil ahead in the in the World Cup pool game where we, we put them to bed early. So, I mean, there was lots of wounds that we left, you know, we inflicted on Scotland. So they came to town to want to be the ones to emulate England last week and put the one of the top teams in the world, you know, um, down to another defeat. But in the modern game of any sport, a professional sport, it is so hard, like... Scotland are all full time professional players. They're not just a poor team. Like so like Gregor Townsend and his backroom staff would have done their homework. They would have looked at how Ireland struggled last week. And, you know, teams are picked apart. So also I think is this Peter Mahoney that question, Connor Murray, a couple of players probably stepping away after a really successful World Cup and they, they do speak about how enjoyable the setup is, same with Keane Healy. Like it seems to be a lovely environment in. So even to leave people who are friends and everything like that in the end of a championship. So I think there was a lot of contributing factors to last week on top of the pressure of winning back to back. And again, like the, this team are setting new records, like they've 19 um, straight home home wins. Like, again, that's a, a new stat in itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the big thing for us is whether they stumble upon the line, this is if Ireland want to be successful on a broader scale, whether that's tours down to South Africa or you know, anyone we get in the lines or eventually in the next World Cup cycle, it's those really crappy wins. Like if we were to look at a Premier League season or even the URC or the European Cup, there will be teams who win, who lift that trophy at the end of the season and they will have a purple patch. They will stumble over results and just get over the line against games they should have lost. And that's a sign of really, really good teams. And look, that's an art, that's a, a thing I'd like to be chatting about rather than, you know, oh, we threw away that championship or we didn't, you know, finish it after being the deserving team. So, look, it's it's a sign of where we've thrown a corner and where Andy Farrell has brought this team, you know, really upper echelons of, of world, world rugby. Yeah, consistency is probably the trademark of this team now that they're able to back up performances week on week. And we saw in the past two weeks that England and Scotland defensively really put it up to Ireland. Have teams started to figure us out? Um, I don't know if they've figured this out. I think there's a bit of an evolution of the game plan as well that has to happen. I think what you show over the past couple of weeks, the teams can, can see certain patterns happening and you can kind of, by the time you get to the end of a championship, you're able to kind of put a defensive system in place to deal with that. Um, I think, they, as Lindsay said, they do the analysis and you see Scotland would have looked, done the homework on, on yeah. how teams defend and maybe would have kept people on their feet or you attack the breakdown just to slow it down and see how Ireland cope. And Ireland know that that's going to happen. And this is where the evolution of what they're going to do in the summer, say, perhaps. And if teams do that, what do they do? And what's their plan B? And and that's the exciting thing that mm-hmm. we need to be able to kind of flip if we can and go back, revert to tight then if we have to and get quick ball. And if we're not getting quick ball, what do we do? And um, look, it's it's a case of teams also have to defend it and try and stop it and if they can't stop it and they've really gone for it it's a hard thing um, it's a hard thing for a team to kind of come back with so um, look I'm pretty happy with how, how they went you know and look England did show if they are physical if they, if, if they do match up how do we do it there's questions there I guess but um, and I'm certain there's going to be massive questions I think in the summer South Africa is going to be such mm-hmm. a huge animal that's I'm sure we'll talk about it. It's going to be something really exciting in, in terms of a challenge for that side, t- challenge for the coaching group. And also as well, I think we have mentioned it, is like that's Andy Farrell's last yeah, Six Nations so, till 26. So, you know, there's, like we talk about, oh, what we're going to do, we missed out in the Grand Slam, but what a side to do that, you know. Mm-hmm. And we do kind of sometimes get carried away with more success, more success. And we, we eat it up so quickly. But this group have been phenomenal, you know, and given great excitement and it's, hopefully only going to get better. That's it. We'll touch on South Africa a bit later on, but picking up on James's point there about Andy Farrell, everyone speaks about this environment that he has created and you call him Faz yourself. You're, oh, in, you're, yeah, you're in with Andy. <laughs> but um, they use 32 players um, this championship and it's just, it's, it's a great step up for these players that they're learning 
at the highest level mm. and he's building this depth the whole time and none of them looked off the mark. No, let, let's take Calvin Nash, for example. Do you know, it wasn't too long ago he's on the emergent tour, then he's looking for consistency with Munster, then he's finally getting an opportunity in an Irish camp and he started all five games and I thought he was absolutely brilliant. And, he, he, you know, again, Andy Farrell doesn't um, sugarcoat if, if, if lads are performing and they deserve their opportunity and they're performing in camp, then they get their opportunity. And, you know, that's an exciting time for players to know that they have an opportunity and they're rewarded, you know, for the performances. Um even the fact that, you know, their celebrations looking on media where they're singing um, Oasis, you know, with the stadium's empty and they're in their suits and they just look like a group that got on so well. And when you like you can't buy that, like you can't mm-hmm. magic it, you know, that has to grow organically. Then he's in Keown, he looks like one of the players, like he's in great shape. He could probably still play himself, you know, so it's just a lovely environment. But he's also, I think, I would hope they take opportunity now when they do go to South Africa, not only to just pick up on James's point with, you know, when teams are pin- picking you apart, there's, you can't really change an awful lot within a championship. So they probably look at over the summer now, mm. look at how we can improve, how we can play against bigger teams and no better opposition than South Africa. But I would also hope that the likes of Kieran Frawley you probably come in into more heated games that he would get opportunity to kind of really develop over that time. And then lads who are on the fringes, I'd love to see Thomas O'Hearn, I'd love to see Ryan Bard get a, a, a starting berth to really, he's done really well off the bench, but is he worthy of a starting spot? We'll see. So it'll be a nice idea to to kind of play around with uh, that next layer of young yeah. talent coming up and really expose them because you don't know where players are at until they're at test rugby. And I'm not sure I'd want to be pitched against South Africans as one of my yeah. first test <laughs> matches, but you know, that's the, if you can survive at that top level, then you, you know, you'll definitely survive. Yeah, and Andy Farrell has really driven those standards, like he said himself, Jack Crowley and the media maybe were too nice to him, but that he has he has put set this bar for him and wants him to keep improving. And he had a brilliant championship. When you think of all the talk about life post Johnny Sexton coming into this championship, the fact that he played, didn't he play every minute yeah. and he, he carried that team really yeah, and testament to him as a as a person to be able to carry that because he would have known coming into that that there is that expectation and Johnny's gone and who can step into his boots and that's a lot of pressure, you know, and and everyone would have been looking at him and looking at fine detail of every single decision he makes and, you know, I think was it against France, he kicks the ball through and it goes dead and it was like, oh, wrong decision and what's he doing there and it's easy to point the finger at someone like him but I think he showed... Um, that he's stronger than that and he's not afraid of to, to constantly keep trying things. Mm-hmm. If something doesn't work, dust himself off, goes back again mm-hmm. and doesn't stop trying, which is which is great, you know. And um He owns it, doesn't he? He completely does, you know, and he has a go and that's what you want as a ten and you don't want him to shrink, it'd be shrinking violet and in the face of adversity just to slip back on no one wants that and you want your ten, especially when you've had someone like we've been blessed, you know, when when you've someone like Johnny Sexton been there, but I thought he was superb, had a superb Six Nations and he was one of the few people who, who played every single minute. And again, on, on Lindsay's point again, there was like five debutants in the Six Nations. And just mm-hmm. for, for me, it's about the depth, you know, it's that it's that, mm-hmm. that tier, that group just below your normal starters, you know, because if you get a couple of injuries, who else steps in? OK, we saw Jordan Larmer yeah. at the weekend and he might have popped into many people's heads, but all of a sudden he's there and it's like, OK, if that happens, we need to be ready and especially going down to such a physical place as South Africa, it's going to be a very tough mm-hmm. tour down there and you're going to need squad depth and it's a great chance for players to show they can do. Yeah, and um, Andy Farrell, he's always embraced aver- adversity and when things go wrong, he looks at it as, as an opportunity and he said post-match, even after beating Scotland and winning the championship, that he thinks it's a good thing that they were beaten by England because this group have the younger players probably have become so used to winning that the learning is in when they get beaten. Yeah, and you, you have to stay hungry, you know, as a collective and as and as individuals because it, does, it becomes mundane, becomes monotonous. There's no excitement, there's no intrinsic motivation for you to get better and challenge yourself if teams aren't really putting it up to you. And I think it was a nice slap in the face of reality. And, and we all need that. And it's it's not a... It's not to sound negative. It wasn't ideal, the timing of the loss, because, you know, to do back to back Grand Slams would be would have been absolutely historic. And everyone wished that for that, excuse me, group of players. But I think what I love about Andy Farrell is he's so pragmatic, like he he looks at every 
outcome as an opportunity and the biggest learnings are actually from losses rather than winnings. I know there is, you always review and you look at what you could have mm-hmm. done better, but there's no better learnings than from losses. And I say that always some of my best learnings, even though I would have rather a few more wins <laughs> uh, came on the back of losses because you do have to dust set self, you, yourself off. You have to look at yourself. What could I have done better? And, you know, then you motivate yourself to be better the next time you go out. So. I think also this England team, we were waiting for them to really crack on and they're probably going to be the team of the next probably 12 to the next couple of years if they can continue on what they've hopefully mm-hmm. clicked on. They were probably unlucky against France and we'll speak about it in a few minutes. But yeah, that's what I love about Andy Farrell. He keeps his players grounded. There's no there's no bullshit. There's no plumas. And like, you know, we could have win. We won games, I'd say, even against Wales, though, we, we won and we won well, really. There was probably areas he probably absolutely lambasted them about. And that's what he does. That's what he pushes the standards. That's the feedback from a lot of players, even on Lions Tour when he was a defensive coach. Like, he would read the Riot Act because he, I would think he abides by the same standards he puts on his own players. Do you know, that was the man he was and that's the, the what he expects of his players. So, um, he fascinates me, I have to say, and I, I'm excited to see now what he'll do with the, with the Lions team. Well, speaking of players and coaches that set standards, Peter O'Mahony, we're only speculating that he has played his final game in an Irish jersey, a warrior, a leader from the moment he started playing rugby and such an influence on this group of players. Yeah, massively so. And yeah, if it is, it's all the speculation at the moment of if it is his last time in an Irish shirt. The temptation for him, I guess, has got to be that 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 um, the finish of a, a as an Irish player captain down in South Africa with a with a tour win would be unbelievable way to finish. But look, not many players get to finish the way they want to finish, you know, and on a high and winning the Six Nations. And if he does right off into the sunset, look, he's been what a stalwart. Um, is lucky enough to share the dressing room with him at Munster when he was brought on as captain as well. And he's just one of these players who leads by actions, and you see what he does. And um, He's been superb for everything he's done in red and, and sure he's going to have more time hopefully in the red and, and in green if he finishes. So be it. But what a way to go out for someone like that, yeah. you know, and deserves all the plaudits. Yeah, he could have more miles on the clock. Maybe we're riding him off too soon. Mm. But the way the players speak about him shows the respect they have for him. Even Ryan Baird, who's fighting for the same jersey as him, he said consistency is O'Mahony's friend and that he's been an idol to him since he started playing rugby as well. Yeah, I was lucky enough to be at the match on Saturday and I actually watched an embrace with Ryan Bird and, and P. Romani. And I watch all the embraces because you can kind of see how maybe the relationship between players and uh, there was kind of a bit of chat amongst them. And um, it showed, I, I took it that the the interaction was just the respect actually both players have for P. Romani for the 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 huge man mountain and athlete that Ryan Bard is and how much he probably be pushed him and also then from Ryan Bard how much he enjoys chasing him so I suppose I noticed Hugo Keenan in just the snippets we saw of him warming up and he had tears in his eyes and I, I watched an embrace with a man he whether that was because he was captain and he was trying to console him him being on the cover of the the match programme there was just it's just too much really to, for me to say that he's going to stay on with Ireland and I think probably and I speak from my own experience, there comes a time where you just know it's the right time to walk into the sunset because you've you've left on, on a high and what a high he has left on, but into where he has left that jersey and, and improved it even more to, from who wore it before him. So that's all you can do in the jersey. And I think he's etched his passion, his blood, his sweat, his tears in that number six jersey. And he has left a legacy that people will only need to try and follow and, and surpass if they can. Um, I do think he's more miles in the clock in a Munster jersey and I certainly do yeah. hopefully see him on the next and the Lions in 12 months time if he can survive that but I think yeah my gut feeling is it's, it's probably his time now to and what a way to end to it. it what a way exactly. and you know what maybe yeah. take opportunity to say thanks for everything a huge congratulations to him he's been absolutely immense and do you know what the testament didn't when people are I know he was probably giving out telling them to buzz off when they lifted his jersey but the bit of crack and they tried to kind of annoy him I think yeah. they do get good mileage out yeah. so it's testament it again of the, the man he is and just the same with his family and his kids and his wife after it was lovely. I think as well we never mentioned it before that that probably would have bought into the week as well a small bit in the background with mm. Conor Murray you know, and, and simmering him. away yeah, yeah like questions and they might have like, he was asked during the week a hell of a lot about it you know is this your last game and you don't want to take away from that maybe that was the way yeah. they wanted to be as selfless players uh, sorry I'm dragging Conor Murray into this but like I'm but like with Pete um, he just wanted to be about the team and then kind of yeah. let things settle maybe and then perhaps have an announcement but it, as I say if that's the case what a way to go out and like it's it really is for someone to be able to 
kind of choose when to go out it's so lucky to be able to do that because you look at 95% of players maybe more yeah. they can't it just, it just finishes even Johnny Sexton oh mm -hmm. we're going to have his last couple of games injury bang done and it's forgotten about and yeah. you move on you know and it's it's ruthless and that's the sport but hopefully um, well even yeah. his time at Leinster he didn't get to do that he's yeah, exactly, lucky enough yeah. at the World Cup like, but. and you had a, maybe O'Driscoll was the one who got the best, the biggest one yeah. you know but every, but if he got an injury then it's finished and same with Raj and Paul O'Connell mm -hmm. and just finished and done and if he can do that in front of a crowd deserves it Absolutely. Well, before we round up the other matches, um, a word on Scotland. It feels all too familiar. They go in with expectation. They go in with confidence. And it was another underachievement for them. It is considering like, you know, the likes of Glasgow and, and Edinburgh are actually performing. You know, F Finn Russell is, is doing immensely at Bath who are, who are flying the flag there. So it's they have such fabulous players. But Finn Russell probably wasn't in it. We knew he'd be key to it. Um, was a little bit out of sorts. Same with Van der Murphy. He was he had a kind of like hands on the hips moment on the wing. He didn't get an awful lot of ball when he did. Yeah. Thankfully, we smothered him. Um, it's clear they focus so much on the defensive yeah. side. Yeah, yeah, and the thing is, like, they were dominant tackles, but they didn't turn Ireland over. To yeah. like, if you look at Ireland when we turned the ball over for Gary Ringrose, is absolutely unbelievable line break. I was like, how is he so <laughs> fast? I can understand why he's on the wing now, but. You know, they didn't use all that dominance on the defensive side and all that hard work to kind of put Ireland in under pressure on the attack side. Like if you're going to, for me personally, my thoughts are if you're going to put so much pressure on, like a lot of teams thrive on their attack from turnover ball on the defensive side, but they don't seem to use that. They just want to disrupt and make it just be a pain in the arse really. But they don't, they didn't feed off that. They can at times and they had done in previous matches, but they, again, they just yeah. do not do it consistently. Is there a they mental fl frailty there that they can't get these performances together, that they can't see it through? There's got to be something there. And I think there's got to be questions asked as well in the background of like Gregor's been there a fair amount now and things haven't really moved on. And this Scotland team were a generational team in inverted commas when they had yeah. Stuart Hogg there. And, um, you know, Scotland were really pushing the side forward. Look, I know the they've kind of flipped and said that we we're arrogant Irish and um, that they were supporting England ahead of we were playing them and my head that one's turned but it's it's um, it's interesting for them they just really haven't kicked on or found a gear or found consistency and that just goes to show even more so how lucky we are to have that consistent side um, but Scotland yeah just at sixes and sevens they can produce kind of one-off games but to do it over hmm. a short period of time and week in, week out, it's 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 too hard for them to do. Yeah, and it's just another disappointing championship for them. Um, looking at the team of the tournament, really, Italy, amazing. They had their best ever Six Nations finish, two wins and a draw after receiving the wooden spoon in the last eight championships. And we're all delighted for Italy because Italy have now come to the party and Ireland are the only team that really put it up to them this championship. Italy were mind-blowingly fabulous. Everything you expect from Italians, their passion, their flair. Um, I think they got try the round there. Uh, their fullback scored against, like it, it came from a set-piece play and it was just magic. Their running lines were perfect. Their offloads were, I mean, pinpoint and just on the point of possibly being turned over and like the Welsh players, defenders committing and in the go and even the footwork to change it, change their running line. They're just a different team and they're absolutely fabulous to watch and I felt so sorry for them at the World Cup nearly to the point of being frustrated and annoyed with them like you know you are better than this as much as you're not world class a rugby team mm -hmm. or you're not renowned for, you, for your rugby press or, or anything like that they just I just thought they were brilliant and I was excited um, to watch and only that it overlapped with our own game you know I would have sat there and watched them all day I think they were so much value for money and I'm delighted to see and, and I hope it's just not the change yeah. Excuse me, and coach, they have some absolutely mm. phenomenal players. Their under twenties were exceptional as That's well. That's it. They they've performed so well underage for years, and I think now they're just bearing the fruits of all that hard work. Yeah, thank God, and and we can see that. Um, I want to keep going, calling him uh, Lemoncello, but Menoncello, like uh, he's just been unbelievable. Um, Ioane has just again kind of fed off that because he's you know he is stand out on his own as a winger, but like he just has now other players around him. Lamaro, the captain, absolutely made shit excuse my language of anyone who could get his hands off in every round and I just thought he was from the man who was putting his hand up nearly in tears being subbed in during the World Cup to now see him absolutely drive his team forward and lift that trophy against Scotland um, to be honest I was quite emotional I really have to say they, mm -hmm. they 
definitely got into my heart and I was, you know, a little soft spot for Italy. <laughs> I think everyone does. What's the main thing do you think James Casada has done with this side now from Kieran Crowley's reign? Oh, look, I, I think it's, yeah. You, you gave you hope him a it's hug not, anyway. Well, it's, yeah, well, it's not, yeah. Well, you hope it's not just the change in coach because that wouldn't reflect too great They're more the pragmatic though with yeah, their performance. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they would be a little bit. But I also agree with Lindsay in that it's, the under 20s that have come through and it's probably since Conor O'Shea was there in his time and he went over and um, Steve Abood who installed these um, I wouldn't say installed these um, uh, regimes I guess well, underage rather than just yeah, going in to try and fit the structures rather than just trying to deal with the senior team he went in and said right, okay let's let's start underage bring them through and beforehand they were, the teams are doing well under 20s coming into seniors and when you get used to getting hammered every week, it becomes a habit then, and it's yeah. hard to break that cycle. And I think these teams are much stronger mentally as well as physically. Um, and a couple of wins, it's amazing what it does, and that's the confidence within the side. They don't just rely on one or two players. There's pretty good players across the park within that. Uh, and they probably should, well, they should have beaten the French as well, you know, and geez, like, um, imagine now, what a tournament. I and I really, really hope that it's not just a flash in the pan. I know that they have... Um, been pretty consistent with it but you know need them to back it up next season and not just mm. have it one year and go okay great yeah. and, and revert the type it's keep that going and put the pressure on because look well seem a bit of a, a basket case at the moment and uh, after they played Ireland I was kind of like okay well I'm sure we'll come on to Wales but you were kind of going okay they did okay there's work there they can do but yeah that's just um, yeah, well, yeah, what, we're going to talk about Wales now what's going on there like they've picked up the wooden spoon for the first time since 2003 Warren Gatland handed in his resignation after that game offered to hand it in they refused it they want him to stay on I agree with James that we saw flashes in the first few rounds of endeavour from Wales and what they were trying to do, but they fell off a bit and at the weekend and probably the week before as well. I mean, it's a complete rebuild. They will need time and support, but on the flip side, they'll need to win games to get that financial boost to put the structures in place. So they're in a difficult situation. They are, but... It's not. It's not a surprise to people. I mean, we would have been talking on this show last year about what state the Wales the Welsh regions were in. They were losing games in the URC, their club teams. You know, week in week out. So this isn't just um, you know an overnight thing. This has been unfortunately when you don't. Um, and we've just spoke about Wales on the flip side that you know they had obviously their centres and their underage associated with Benetton and Zebra and then their under twenty. So that you you have a conveyor belt. We're very lucky here in the schools where we here. And the other, you know, we've just come off the back of the the All Ireland Skills Cup, mm-hmm. so we've 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 a production line of players, thankfully, but Wales have let that fall by the wayside, and all the players underneath their professional setups, unfortunately, they haven't been nurtured that. So this isn't a surprise to me. I, I'm glad um, Warren Gatland didn't resign because, to be honest, I I was impressed with Wales. We knew they were going to get the wood spoon prior to the tournament. We would be very surprised. It was more so could Italy be form rather than Wales just not performing I was impressed with what inexperience they had there that they actually put performances together I think the demands of the championship unfortunately for any young team who are inexperienced was going to just bite them in the backside towards the end I think that's just what what happened there's so much motivation and pressure on you and it takes so much energy out of you so by the end of a championship whether you're on the top of that uh, leaderboard or on the bottom every team is going to be struggling and it comes down to thankfully Ireland had depth and we just got over the line and and that's where kind of probably the consistency and the depth got us over whereas Wales didn't have that luxury so I think right now Warren Gatlin needs to work his magic with that group of players who deserve that I think they really showed pride in their jersey they really stood up well they were unfortunate with results yeah they fell off but they did show glimpses for me that there's potential there but now they have to just put the love in the regions and really I mean throw everything they can at it to try and, and buy them a bit of time because I think that the changeover which is never easy to for such a wealth of experience and a playing group that brought them so much success they probably outstayed their welcome which is hard it's 
it probably sounds rootless for me, but on a World Cup cycle, it probably should have happened before the World Cup cycle or else you had to wait till after and they've waited till after and they just now have to really look at this rebuild. It's the start of a World Cup cycle. It's nothing to panic about. Yeah, yeah. You just have to be not so demanding on yourself and, and have so much expectation. But I think there's potential there and that's the exciting part for Wales. So is it just time in the saddle for these players and patience from fans that, that it will come together, especially if Warren Gatlin stays at the helm? Yeah, I think so. I think if... It, other teams have done it before and England would normally do it a lot and once that post World Cup they'll have a bit of a clear out and they were pretty um pretty big in a clear out Wales. But I certainly think that more time together, um couple of wins, like it's year one. We don't as Irish with the RFU, they don't really look at it in, in that kind of four year cycle because we go hard to the Six Nations all the time. We don't rebuild and in that sort of way we try and bring players through each year. I think Wales ago, right, four year cycle, let's go. These players in four years' time will have 20, 30 caps and they'll be so experienced come that time. And that's their time to shine. That's when they'll be judged. I'm just trying to think if, if Wales are touring Australia this year in the summer or not. I think they have June, they have South Africa in South, June. Okay, okay, yeah. ouch. Okay, lovely. Um, I thought, okay, I was like, okay, Australia might be the worst place to go down yeah. to, you know, to kind of try and get your confidence back. But, um, yeah, That's look. the other side, though, isn't it? T- teams won't want to play them. They won't get good quality in between them. Sorry. To, no, as no, no, that. absolutely. But it's, it, yeah, I just think that time and the saddle, they will come together, you know, and look, the club rugby scene in Wales is very uh, in turmoil. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's it's hard then to come into a Welsh camp and have that positivity as well. And obviously, when you take defeat, it's it's a bruised ego. It's tough. you got to lift it. And that's up to the coaches then and the management staff to lift it and bring standards. And I think it's a case of, um, yeah, more game time. Hopefully get a couple of wins. Once they get that first win, yeah. they'll all buy in. It's that extra little bit of buy in. Yeah, we see what we're doing. See what we're doing. We see where we're trying to go. Because we did see side. it in flashes in the first few rounds. And it's just that, like, it's that consistency yeah. word that we mentioned the whole time. And it's it's great to be able to do that. But if you're going to attack, right, you have to defend too. You know, and it's yeah. Scotland. You, if you're going to defend, flip side, you have to attack. So just getting that balance right, you know, it's it's putting your heart on the line is all well and good, but you need more than that. They just concentrate on defence though. And that's yeah. all you could do going into that championship when you have such a brand new team. Um, you can only fix one thing at a time. I mean, mm-hmm. if Warren Gatland and his backroom staff were to kind of say, right, let's fix it all at once, I'd say they would have been absolutely trounced in every game. Whereas they set their stall out, they had huge clarity, very impressed with their defensive setup. And you could see that in the Irish game, the amount of players they still had on their feet. Um, their chop tackling was, if anybody wants to prove their chop tackling, we talk about Will Connors, Will Connors but I have yeah. to say, I was so impressed with the fundamentals of, of Wales' tackling. And you could see the amount of time they put into that. Um, and they were dominant hits and when you've dominant hits and putting an opposition back in the game line um, and winning that game line battle you you really are giving yourself an opportunity it's just that they didn't really have much to attack but mind you they had some really cheeky moments where they got some great tries whether that's you know yeah, exploiting Rio the Dwyer, pillar so quick on the wing do you know what he is brilliant but yeah. he you know he's exploded onto the scene and he hasn't yeah. really disappointed so this look I have no doubt there's big days to come in, in the Welsh series I suppose we're talking about a four year cycle for them to really measure where they're at the good thing for any of the Six Nations team is they have high quality test matches year in year out you know and that's good in between that now it's what Warren Gatlin does for camps and more so getting them absolute test games to measure themselves up because it's those mistakes and those harsh learnings that we look about and I think they need to accelerate the harsh learnings unfortunately so it's, it's going to be a tough old time for them but no doubt that we can hopefully see um, mm. a little bit of sunshine and Welsh rugby in the next little while Well on to France and England I'm sure there's plenty of sunshine after the week uh, after the weekend a very entertaining game France finished second after beating England and if there are another few weeks left in the Six Nations who knows because those two teams they they, they they seem to be hitting their straps now. Yeah, certainly. And we talk about Wales there and, and, and getting that time and fixing one things. And you can see when England fix one or two things, how good they can be. And at the start of the Six Nations, it was like, what way are we trying to play? What are we trying to do? And all of a sudden now, within five and six week period, it's, yeah. oh, we know what we're trying to do now. And all of a sudden, the evolution is there. And Felix Jones is lauded as this defensive, do you know, but it's all... In a couple of weeks, and yeah. um, they, what a game it was! It was nice to see England get, like get a bit of a uh, last-minute uh, reprieve there. It's Thomas <laughs> Ramos. I was very happy with that one going over. Um, that took plenty of abuse the week so before cute. from English people. But what, what, like, 
I don't know, defensive coaches might have been scratching their heads a little yeah. bit, but um, that quite a game of rugby to finish it as well. And yeah, absolutely. High octane um, pick hits going on there and some wonderful flashes of brilliance from, from both sides. Um, but in, look, I think France would be very disappointed, though, in, in looking back on how their Six Nation went, went ultimately. You know, I think Galte would have been under serious pressure, especially if they'd lost Italy. Probably looking at the way the French go, might have got the chop yeah. if that had happened. And... But can this one win against uh, against England be a turning point for this side? Perhaps, you know, it was, a, it was a hell of a long hangover for the French side from the World Cup. And maybe this last game, as you say, a couple more weeks, what would have happened? Yeah, absolutely. Galtier said it was the Six Nations from hell. And <laughs> Sean Edwards was saying that they have a lot to improve on. Where do you stand on France now? Um, I and you think, think Dupont and Entomac have to come back into they that team. They have to come in, but yeah. was absolutely, I mean, he what is brilliant. it? He is unbelievable. And mm-hmm. how he didn't start the championship a little bit sooner, like his pass against, uh, was it Wales, the behind the back pass mm. to oh, just yes. kick off the attack was unbelievable. And I think if, if France were actually guilty of anything, it's just probably not taking opportunity when they did make changes for some of their upcoming, no, they, I can't remember his name now, they did a very young centre will come in as well. Um, Deportier. Yeah, Deportier. Yeah. Like he was, he was excellent again Wales as well. So I think if they're guilty of anything, it's just not taking a chance. Um, and if you had have said two weeks ago that oh France were going to finish second, I mean we all put it probably held around the table laughing because they just did not so shines so show signs of that even that was a tongue twister. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think they just need to now really start to I can't, probably layer because they really had the the Dupont effect. Yeah. It, they, it was a hangover from him leaving rather than the World Cup I think do you know when we saw his brilliance in the sevens like the, I think ping, people questioned him but I think people also questioned the impact he has on his team and I think we we saw that but I have to say Legarco was hugely impressed for for a man so young I know he's, he's rassing and uh, what's he 21 but um, you know he got tries he wasn't afraid to take responsibility and I just thought he brought something different to France and he probably should have been in a little bit sooner and that's probably the only thing I would say they're guilty of we always expect petulance on these you know the French to throw their toys out of the pram because that's how fabulous they are you know that whether we're talking about sport or them personally um, and that's what they bring to a tournament but look they finished second they'll be very happy with it and I think now again just look to rebuild but yeah test the young players like the top 14 is one of the most exciting leagues in in the world and we see that when they see them in European competition mm-hmm. as well so take chances on those young French players and, and definitely take the summer to, to build your layers because I think competition breeds success and it pushes players on and I think when they um, when they lose players that are big names you know they shouldn't have to have a huge such a downward spiral on that Yeah the pressure seems to be off a bit now that they won um, that last game England they stopped Ireland from winning the Grand Slam in impressive form are you seeing what they're building now and do you think the pressure is off them in a way as well um, it's amazing what a win can do do you know what I mean before the Irish game I was kind of struggling with it a little bit to see how he was going to evolve that game of the kicking and having someone at George Ford um, playing 10 versus a Marcus Smith and the way he played at Leicester coached at Leicester and that transition he, he took this England team in the World Cup and obviously it was a short term and he couldn't change too much but like you'd expected him to now in this reign to kind of right, try and implement something else first few weeks didn't see it it's bits starting to come in I guess look everyone's buying themselves a bit of time too with the everything takes 16 weeks or 16 games to embed <laughs> so that's nice you know it's people aren't expecting instant success with things but yeah maybe they'll be happier kind of towards the end the last two games albeit losing to the French but played a bit better better, uh, better brand of rugby as well but still it's very it just goes to show how important George Ford is for them I don't think they can push him to the side and just play this running rugby with Marcus Smith I think he was very calm, um, George Ford, Lovely and controlled things. Well yeah, exactly. Tries. And I just think he knows what to do in the right place, right time. Um, I had a, an air of calmness. Um, kind of think a few people were losing their heads around him. He just seemed to go, no, let's not get caught up in a game mm-hmm. against France and played as joué joué and throwing everything around. They just bang, kick when we had to kick, play when we had to play. And it's to get in the balance right, and I think maybe slowly getting there. Yeah, worrying for Ireland if we were looking ahead to next year's Six Nations, but great for the competition if we have a competitive England and France. Oh, look, the competition needed those hiccups or those, I suppose, um, unexpected uh, 
wins and losses and performances and you couldn't take your eyes off to, you know, to end the championship, you couldn't take your eyes off England and France. And I think I, I do agree uh, with James. I think to for any team to play that high octane style of rugby, there has to be this calm brains. And that is where George Ford comes in. And it's about game management is when to really pick up the speed, is when to slow it down, when to kick to territory, when to look at your set piece, when you're in the green zone, what are your options? So um, definitely more exciting stuff. Uh, Alex Mitchell, I was very impressed with, with the speed of Rook. Um, obviously Finn Smith is to come in there and, and add an addition um, and yeah I think the the partnerships and the Henry Slade and the performances he was putting in in Europe for Leicester um, you know we kind of saw glimpses as uh, um, when Ollie Lawrence as well when he, he came in to partner, partner him uh, in centre we, we saw that what they're capable of but yeah I think it's, it's nothing but good for the competition because again we never know in the northern hemisphere how we pitch against the southern hemisphere like we always go by the six nations but I think the better the competition the six nations for us the, the more adaptable we are to, to conquer the southern hemisphere nations when we get to the, the big four year stage of the World Cups um, because you know and especially with England bringing that physicality you know, we need teams to match the South Africans and the New Zealands and the Australias of this world that we can actually compete with them and Argentina as well, who bring huge physicality. So it's nice to have not only that high octane rugby like a basketball match, it's it's nice to have the physicality as well that you, you expect from usually the Southern Hemisphere teams. Well, Ireland will be focused on the Southern Hemisphere now. Next, they have a very ex- exciting few months ahead and a better challenge they couldn't ask for against the world champions in South Africa. What are you expecting from this tour? Um, it's going to be interesting on field and I'm sure off field even more so with um, Rassi's going to be having some headlines look what a nail Jerry biter there as well. absolutely look what what a nail biter oh, of course yeah you know and he's learning his Africans and uh, yeah he'd be a busy boy we uh, amore yeah good morning <laughs> it's all over I thought it was an Italian accent there. yeah, oh, yeah. Was it? yeah. Damn it. yeah I haven't learned Italian now but it's uh, it's look it's going to be an interesting one it's going to be quite a challenge I think a lot of South Africans if you know any are not too happy with everyone saying that Ireland's the best team in the world against the world champions the world champions for a reason um, yeah. they know how to play tournament rugby and they can win games and look it's a great challenge what a challenge um, and it's going to be a tough challenge I think you know I really do um, if players move on um, going down there as opposed to playing them up here it's, it's very different you know and as you say what a challenge it is for this group to go down and pit themselves against the world champions and if you can get down there and get a result it's nearly like the old New Zealand going down to New Zealand to try and get that result if you can get that monkey off your back it's yeah. it's huge um, and to do it down there as I say in the volatile crowd it'll be pretty harsh going for everyone it's going to be a long time down there and you just hope that the players aren't too fatigued we saw them kind of stumble right yeah, they players. did look tired will, will the past they, will two they, weeks yeah exactly and will they get a break and will he change will some players want to rest well not they, want, they won't want to rest but will they try and rest some players and it's it's it'll be tough yeah that's the question how will Andy Farrell approach this now will we see the front line players travelling or will he leave some players at home and try to give younger players uncapped players a chance it's it's a nice balance you'll have to strike actually because you want the experience so that you can perform, uh, but you obviously want to expose the the younger players to to that test match rugby and the experience even on field like we spoke about George Ford there. But you have to and the Piro man he said will be a big loss to to have that experience head to be able to speak to referees to to know what to expect to bring to opposition like the South Africans who will have it's hugely hostile. They absolutely are mad about their rugby. They're so passionate, especially on home soil. It will definitely bring it. A, a, a sharper edge, shall we say. Um, but the other flip side is the, the pos- not that it's not a positive plane, but the other positive side is that you want younger players getting into to this bubble when you go on, on tour and you kind of get to strip back and actually see the personalities. So to really immerse yourselves and get that boy in mm-hmm. and, and players are going to step out or players probably need a rest. It'll depend really on how the, the provinces do in the U- European competition, how long they go in and players like, bodies will needs rest so it'll be interesting to see the senior players who he brings but I don't think he can, he can afford to kind of go really like new edge that everyone's new with, with very inexperienced because we have to be performing as well and I think they would going into the lion's den as we say um, it would be pretty daunting now for some young players who don't mm-hmm. have a lot of test rugby under their, under their belts in a, at an international level Andy Goodman will be coming in I expect during mm-hmm. the summer as well how will Andy Farrell want the team to involve, evolve on field with their performances 
Uh, yeah, that's going to be the interesting point. You know, I think obviously Mike Hatt put his own little stamp on it, and then I think Andy Goodman coming in is going to be very good for the for the attack structure. I think, but I think he knows the players. He knows not that Mike Hatt didn't, but he had to learn it. I think he knows all these mm. young players, what they're capable of, who's coming through, um, and they've been pretty successful Leinster since he's been there. So. I think he'll be bringing um, hopefully a bit more tempo as well. And if he can work out how to beat these physical sides, you know, and how to get a, uh, evolve that game plan that they're already starting to get a hold of. Look, ultimately, I think it's going to be Andy Farrell who's going to dictate this is a, the style of play and how we want to do it. And maybe he'll bring in some individual ideas himself, which can hopefully unlock a few doors. Obviously, being a Southern Hemisphere coach himself, uh, we can do that. Yeah. What areas, though, do you think? Like, I suppose we're talking about depth here. <coughs> I'm kind of thinking the front row probably like are we looking at what's Keen Healy's job? We probably need another loose head. We definitely probably need another tight like the front row probably need a good a bit of exposure. No better place to go than South Africa. Um, is Tom Ahern going again? Is Sam Prendergast not Keen? But we probably the two Prendergast brothers they probably need a run. Definitely Keen has done Ross an awful Byrne lot. As well. He'll be back. Ross Byrne needs to be back in. How is Harry? Still not sold on Harry myself, but is that because he hasn't got enough time, both at Leinster and International? Is he something, someone who can build consistently and go in? I certainly think now we can't rest in our laurels with 10. So it'd be interesting to see from a 10 position, full back, Hugo Keane, we saw there, I think Jordan Lammer probably underperformed, but at the same time, like poor chap has been playing the wing yeah, for Leinster. He was thrown in there. Absolutely thrown the deep end. So we definitely need a full back. So then does Frawley mm. come in or... Because I was interested to see, you know, I definitely thought at some point then Crowley would, you know, would, with Harry on the bench, Crowley would go to, to full back yeah. and, and Harry would come in. So I think definitely whatever about the personnel, it be, probably for me would be looking at the positions of where we need to deepen. And certainly probably full back 10, nine as well then if, if, if Connor's going to step away. And then obviously Connor comes in like that George Ford and he controls games, whereas... Craig Casey and, and Jameson Gibson Park, who was fantastic, his rugby brain is, is ridiculous. Um, we need to look at nines then as well. So there's kind of a couple of areas where you're like, right, we're fine for now. But if we're to go forward and for this tour, we Now's need to the chance it. to build yeah. depth. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see from those positions, especially front row, hooker as well. I think, uh, I actually think Ronan Keller, was he really made an impact when he came on. Mm -hmm. And I think he's he was one of the few who had 100%, well, up until... The England match, I think he definitely had a hundred percent success rate in his throws. Um, he was physical. He was mm. he's not afraid to get in and, and stuck in. But it's probably then, again, if you have the two lads injured at one point, who's coming in as hooker for you? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, be interesting to see now a couple of lads. And um, before we finish up and move on from the Six Nations, looking back at Ireland's performances, what was the highlight for you, James? Oh, um, I I don't know really. Um, I'm trying to think of anything jumping out on, the, on me now. I suppose, look, Jack Crowley's performance at 10, I think, given pressure, um, external pressure probably more so, and how well he stood up and adapted to taking a mantle off Johnny Sexton, how well he can control things. Uh, he's got to be happy with that. Maybe the five debutants, Joe McCarthy was pretty impactful in that. thought he was go great to have more competition in that area and, and someone of that physique as well to, to cause a bit of damage. Um, but yeah, look, ultimately it's a bit of, it's great to get the, the win in the Six Nations, but just those two players, I suppose, have, mm -hmm. have really come true. Where did you see the most improvement from the World Cup or where did you see Ireland evolve? Or did you? Yeah, I did. well, the evolution is probably that there wasn't just this big drop down from some of the players we lost. I mean, we've mentioned James mentioned Jack Crowley there to come in and fill Johnny Sexton's shoes. As and as we spoke about, it's it's one thing coming in from a very impactful ten, but Johnny Sexton I think uh, made himself a, an enigma in his own right, and he's in a separate category. So to fill to follow in that and to have a young man come in and try things and to own it and to never shy away from continuing to play, I think that was that was huge. So. I think the evolution is that they just started from where they left off in the World Cup. It was disappointing um, and they tried some new things and, and their clarity and, and sticking to the game plan and never giving up is something that, you know, I admired. And I think Calvin Lash has been a standout for me as well. The poor chap at times watching him definitely against Wales and, and Italy and even there the weekend, you know, at times, you know, it's a lonely place, I would think, on the wing <laughs> if you're not getting ball. And then when, it, you know, he was always so solid under high ball or getting it 
you know when he took his opportunity he took it very well so I thought he he was stand out so I think I suppose the evolution is all these players that we spoke about provincially you know lighting up the place and you you would expect this transitionary period for all these young players but there was no transitionary period and I think mm-hmm. that's been the evolution that they just slotted seamlessly in and, and continued on the same trajectory they've been in so how will the players feel after this championship win? Will it linger with them, do you think, James, that they didn't win the Grand Slam? Um, probably for 24 hours and you've got to get over it pretty quickly, you know, and I think they probably dealt with that after the England game. I think you have to bounce back so quickly. You have another mm-hmm. game to play against Scotland and obviously they're over that. Look, it's so hard. Ultimately, it's so hard to win in Six Nations, you know. We haven't done it as often as we put yeah. a light. I think we've been, as I say, mentioned a lot tonight, it, we've been spoiled so much in the last decade or so in, in terms of wins. So, look, it's what an amazing thing to get uh, another Six Nations title. So I don't think they'll be too worried about getting a Grand Slam in a few years. I've forgotten about it, really, and just trying to keep on emulating and keep on medal. developing. Ex- exactly. Look, yeah. and ultimately, when you finish, that's what it's about, having medals. And um, Grand Slams are great, yeah, but Six Nations titles are as good. I'd say they're still out having the, on the Guinness now with the medals around their necks. <laughs> and why not? And why not? You know, it. You know, we we can sit here and say that. You know, you when you're a champion, you think, oh yeah, in that moment, like it's a great feeling, and you want to, you know, it'll come around again. For some people, it never does. Like some people will never win a championship. So, mm. do you know, when you look at successful teams, and we're so proud of this team, um, and yeah, we get selfish and we get greedy and we expect more from them because that's what we want because we know how good they are. But same time, being on the other side as players, it is so hard to be consistent and to get over the line and to win that gold medal around your neck. You know, lots of times you're you're there, thereabouts, but you never yeah. get to wear it. So, yeah. what will this Six Nations do you think be remembered for? For me, it's for Italy. Definitely Italy, and I suppose starting off, we th- we thought it was a done deal exactly who was. Um, but towards the end, it's kind of yeah, someone took up the. The script and absolutely ripped it up, put it in the shredder, and like you didn't know what, where it was going to happen. But certainly, I think standout was was the uh, was the Italians, and I think do you know what? I hope they're not a flash in the pan. I hope they grow yeah. and do big things, and I hope they take a few more scalps in the URC and maybe Europe. We'll see. How do you reflect on the competition, James? Yeah, it's a pretty successful one, wasn't it? Like you know, and I completely agree with uh, Lindsay as well, and it's the Itali- and yourself, it's the Italians, isn't it? That really stood out and. It's the consistency again shown from Benetton in the URC and if you can get wins under your belt. Look, winning's a habit as well and you got to get used to winning, but I, I agree as well. you got to enjoy your wins as well and because uh, you're not going to win every week. So it's mm. about being that consistent side. Um, so Italy, for me, consistency is what we can see. Wales, hopefully develop. France, just... <laughs> Being typically friends. Yeah, been, yeah, well, they're never going to change and yeah. you don't want that. And that's no. the beauty of the Six Nations that I'm sure I'm, I'm probably no one got that Six Nations table, right? You know, it's, who knows where it's going to end up. Everyone's capable of beating everyone on any given day and that's where you want it. Um, before we finish up, the Women's Six Nations kicks off this weekend, Lindsay. No easy task. Ireland have France and England away. Their first championship under Scott Beamond. What are you expecting? First weekend up first against so, France uh, no one wants to go away they're going away to Le Mans to play France um, you certainly don't want that especially the French on home soil whatever about them coming here to, to Ireland but look what I expect for this team is um, that we build on last year unfortunately we were the wooden spoon for the first time I think since 2004 um, not ideal but the thing is we want to definitely get two wins minimum what for me would be what we expect and there's been uh, good chat about Scott and, and his training sessions and what he's done the girls have had a I'm not sure about the quality of matches but certainly they've gotten good standard they've been together which is the most important thing they've been in the training environment together with the Celtic Challenge with their respective teams anyone who's obviously been contracted has been in the HPC so there's been a lot of hard work done I'm sure a lot of soul searching from this time 12 months ago and that was always going to be expected we were the Wales of last year in the sense of we were really starting afresh and we had a lot, a lot of young, talented players who were just inexperienced at test level rugby. So um, let's what I expect is whatever about the result against away, away from France, I expect us to have a performance, mm-hmm. you know, and that would be like definitely heartwarming for me and especially for the girls who put in an awful lot of work. It's very hard when you know how hard you're working to go out and not have the results reflect that. So if we can come away, no injuries from France, 
do you know because we've a lot of injuries after Celtic Challenge anyway from a lot of key players if if I'm hearing right um, so we'll see what the team announcement is during the week but definitely when they come home the following week to Italy in the RDS I hope everyone will put pums on seats for all three home games and uh, we get a win against Italy hopefully uh, Wales and, and Scotland as well but Wales and Scotland have both played in, in much higher tiers in the, mm-hmm. in the new WXV uh, competition so Again, it, you don't know where you're at till you're in your first round, but look, we'll definitely know where we are after France and yeah. make the changes necessary to get a win against Italy. What would a successful Six Nations look like for this group results-wise? Oh, I think uh, definitely five performances, but minimum two wins, I would I would hope, I think, to be successful. I know you kind of go from zero, you know, zero wins last year to thinking, oh, one would be thing, but I think there's a lot of work, there's a lot of talent there and if we can get that clicking. Mm-hmm. Um, I think two wins minimum would be, I'd be very happy to see. And I think they would, for them as well, it's nothing about me or anything else on the yeah. outside. It's for those players to keep them interested and other work is done. And, and as I said, Sc- Scott comes in with a lot of experience from his eight years with England um, as, as the attack coach there. So, and he's obviously an ex-pro himself. So, there's a lot of good players, good staff there, and I would hope they get their just rewards. And as you said, we hope that they get bums on seats and bums home on crowds seats, supporting people. them. Yeah, they're and playing a couple of wins along the way as well. Yeah, I think uh, 31st is Italy at home. Then they go to to Musgrave for the, the weekend, the 13th of April against Wales. And then it'll be up to King, Kingspan on the 27th against Scotland. So yeah, if you're around, get your bum there. Well, we leave it there for today's show. My thanks to James and to Lindsay. It was an entertaining Six Nations. And once again, Ireland are top of the pile. That's the end of House of Rugby for a while. For a while. Thanks for joining us over the past couple of months. Until the next time, from all of us here, Slonga Fold. Sports Show presents House of Rugby.